All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. We have in this episode, Dell Tackett back for our threat number four in our Seven Threats series. Welcome back to the show, Dell. Thanks, Greg. It's good to be here with you. I'm, I'm fascinated by this topic. Uh, we talk about this also a lot on the podcast. Threat number four is the consolidation of massive earthly power. We're talking about tyranny versus what we might call something along the lines of the order of God or yes. uh, things that are, are uh, e- each of us and every, cr- every creature and every creation of God that is supposed to follow certain guidelines and fulfill the measure of its creation, so to speak. Correct. Yeah, that's right. You, you know, the, the whole order of God that we see in his creation, I think, reflects his very nature. And um, I, I believe he's socially complex. And so we see a whole world uh, that God has created uh, systems of pieces and parts, various uh, diverse pieces of parts that God has put together. And uh, those pieces and parts work in a way that God designed for them to work to produce something uh, higher than themselves. And that brings uh, glory to God. And so I look at the world around us, and that's what I see. I, I see these amazing uh, systems that God has made, and, and including social order, that God has created social order in the same way. So, you know, we, we I want to go to the very fundamental of this first uh, level of this. And, and we each have given, been given by God power in the sense that we have choice. Now, some people have more opportunity to exercise power or to gain power than others might. But we all have within our own lives the ability to choose and to either let pride take over and and where we want to go more toward a self-interest and increase our own power, so to speak, or to be more Christ-like and be uh, more meek and follow guidelines and covenants and and, and, uh, commandments, et cetera, that, that God has put into place. But of course, this can go out from the individual. It goes out to the family. How do we act, and and do we do we overexert power in, in in a position of family, in society, in government, in church? Even um, this seems to go right to the core of choice and and the enticement of power for each of us individually. Yeah, and I don't know that there's anything that. Um that pulls us more. We spoke earlier of what I I call the drive for significance and the hunger for significance. Power, for whatever reason we think, having power gives me that significance. And so I seek significance by gaining more power, because I think the more powerful I am and the more significant I am, uh, and of course, the more people will bow down to me, the more they bow down to me, the more significant I feel. And so this is important because we're talking here about God's design, especially for social order, uh, because social order uh, includes people, human beings. And in the inanimate world, um, all the creatures that God made, uh, to a great extent, obey him. So the neutrons and the protons don't try to become something they're not, you know, the the protons don't get angry at the neutrons because they used to sit around, you know, do anything today, you know, get out of here, whatever. The electrons say, you know, we're going to do something else. But in God's design for social order, where he has created um, the state, the family, the church, labor, all of these social orders. And uh, when we did the tree project, we go through each one of those and talk about the design that God has given to us. And it involves authority and submission it involves roles and responsibilities. And when we follow those roles and responsibilities, you know, like the moon, you know, that faithfully does its job, uh, and the tides that do their job, the electrons that do their job, we, uh, in our fallen state, have a tendency to want to break those bounds and, and boundaries and roles that God has given to us because we think it will give us significance. And so, uh, you know, you think about the Old Testament, you think about Saul. Remember Saul, he wanted to do um, the prophet's role, and he lost his throne because of that. 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar, remember on the roof of his palace, palace and he is, uh, he's going on and on about the power that he has. Well, the next thing he knew, God had thrown him out into pasture eating grass like a cow. You, you know, Uzziah, the king Uzziah, great king, but all of a sudden he thought he had the right as the king to do what only the priest could do. And God, uh, you know, brought leprosy upon him. And so God is serious about the roles that he has created for us and the authority that we've been given, delegated by God. And I think this is one of God's most amazing characteristics. I call it even the modus operandi of God, that he creates his creatures and he equips them, empowers them, but he delegates authority to them so that his creatures, using the authority he has given to them, not what they want to gain, using that authority in the structure God has given to him to be fruitful, and that fruit brings glory to God. Satan, on the other hand, consolidates power and makes dependence, and he destroys their fruitfulness and their incentive to be fruitful. And of course, that's what we see happening today. That's a, it seems to me that that is a very um, difficult balance, right? And that, that, that we as humans try to, it's very difficult to keep in place because to, there's so many moving parts, right? Because again, there, there's the individual, there's the family, there's the state, right? There's community. Uh, and, and we, one way we, we help run our community is through the state, right? And, and so if we, I, I have this little thing, uh, where, where I, you know, if you, as you if you just run through scripture, you see the, the power and agency of the individual, right? And that, that agency is really important. And then you have behavior of the individual, including speech, like John the Baptist crying repentance in the wilderness, right? He's, there, there's speech involved here, and it's the individual. And then you move on to something beyond yourself, which is family. Well, now you have a greater responsibility than just yourself. You actually have to watch over family. You got a new organization. How am I going to run that with the power without being, without passively allowing things to happen where I should exert some power or over exerting power in that case. And then of course, beyond that, it's community. And so we put the we put the community into the hands of the state, at least temporally. But the problem again is that balance. If there's too much power in that in that state, then everything below that is going to suffer. The family and the individual are, are going to suffer if there's too much power put in the state. And we see this so much, that, for example, in the Old Testament with the kings. When you have a righteous king and that power is, is in place, things run a lot more smoothly, mm -hmm. right? But when you have a, a, an evil king, right, an unrighteous king, then things change apart. How do you keep that balance in place? Well, it's a good question, and I would agree with you that, you know, this is a constant... Um, balancing act that we have to play. Uh, I, I, if you think of it just simply from a spiritual standpoint, I have that same uh, action myself. You know, how, how much uh, do I feel like I'm in control? How much do I understand that God is truly in control? Uh, how much do I want to take over in my own life? Um, and so it, that happens in personal relationships with each other. Uh, oftentimes, people want to assume power of another individual. Uh, children sometimes want to assert more power uh, in in the family, uh, and it's the job of the parents uh, as their role. Uh, but the parents have to. I remember I heard a, a very wise individual one time told me in terms of parenting responsibilities. Sometimes, when you look at your children, you have to choose your battles wisely. Uh, you know, because sometimes you can, if you try to step in on every time your kids are squawking at each other, you know, that probably won't be good, but you have to choose your, so you have to choose when you assert that authority. And of course, if we look at the state, the founders understood in the very beginning uh, how the propensity of man was to search and reach for more and more power. 
uh, they were trying to build something that would, would protect us from tyranny. And so the Constitution, that's why the Constitution says, look, the federal government, you have you have limited power here. And the states have power. And, and there's a balance here between the states and the federal government. And the state's responsibility was to keep the federal government in control. And the federal government had responsibilities to provide things like treaties and interstate commerce and those kinds of things. So it needed to have certain power. Uh, so you're right. This, it is a constant balancing act uh, that has to be paid attention to, because if you let one uh, get too much authority, then everything breaks down. I mean, this is even true in sports. I mean, you know, if you look at baseball, baseball is really an incredibly wonderful balance of powers. If the what would you think if if the pitcher's mound was ten feet from home plate, right? Well, that it gave too much power to the to the pitcher, and there would never be a hit. But if the pitcher was uh, two hundred feet away, the batter would have all that kind of power. And so, what we've done in baseball is we have the bases are a certain number of feet apart. The pitcher's mound is a certain height and a certain uh, we did three balls two strikes or whatever it is that we allow a batter and so forth. So the whole game uh, has been constructed and it moves and we change rules a little bit to make sure that we have a balance here between the offense, the defense and the umpires and so forth. Uh, and so the same is true. If you're talking about the state, the founders knew we needed to have this kind of balance of power. And, you know, from my perspective, what's happened, if you look at the state as the pitcher, you know, the pitcher, the pitcher is, is moving increasingly closer and closer to the pay, plate. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. And of course, you could take that even further and say, well, if we're all the players on the field, and God has given us these rules, I mean, what if I was the first baseman and, and I tried to take the role of the pitcher also, or if I was the first baseman and, and and I hit to the outfield, I'm trying to play what the second baseman's also trying to do, right, right. in a cutoff situation or whatever it might be. If I'm if I'm going beyond that, then it's going to mess everything up, right? right. Beyond yeah. the 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 uh, the sphere, so to speak, of 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 the power that I've been given to play that position, right? Correct. Right. Um, you, uh, you here, I'm going to quote you here on this and in, in something you wrote about this. You said, in a fallen world, true love and delegation of authority is not always executed with righteousness. One of the most consistent acts of evil is when man defies God and consolidates power to himself well beyond what God has designed. That's kind of what we've been talked about talking about, but isn't it our responsibility then also? to, as God has given us power, oftentimes we also, in order to check our own power and, and to make things run properly, have to delegate that power ourselves as well. Isn't that right? Yes. And I, and I think the reason that is, that is right and proper to do, because we see God doing that himself. So God delegates authority. That's why I think one of the most incredible things is that God delegates authority to a plant uh, that gives the plant the authority to produce new life. He, he delegates authority to the, to the animals and to human beings, and he gives them the authority, responsibility to be able to reproduce, to be able to work with their hands and produce new things. Um, and so this delegation of authority is a divine characteristic and so we ourselves uh, can therefore then, if I own a business, that I can hire workers and delegate to them responsibilities to help me in the sphere of labor to have a business that is, that is fruitful. In the family, we delegate authority as a child grows up. We delegate authority to them, not only to help in the household, but also to help train them in terms of what it means to be a good worker with a good work ethic. And so the delegation of authorities is a divine uh, thing. And I think that's what happens. What we see in the state is when the state no longer 
uh, begins to recognize God has given them certain power and a role. The Romans 13 says the, church, the state, state's primary role is to punish evil and to condone what is good. Well, when you move away from that, as we talked about last time, where the church, the, the, the state has begun to assume a feminine role of being a nurture and comfort rather than protect and defend, then the state has moved, has rejected God's uh, order and the delegation of authority for it to do certain things, and it has now assumed other things, um, and that never ends well. It doesn't end well in the family. It doesn't end well in the state or the church. And of course, if the state's got the power, then they can do that, right? They, if, they, if, they, if we have given them that much power, then they can take on those, I'll call it toxic feminine roles, or a toxic masculine role, or whatever it is. Yeah. They, they have the power to do that, because we've given that to them, ultimately, and that, that balances. I, I think it's remarkable. One of the things I think is so remarkable about um, you know, the, the founding of the United States is we, we need to realize, I think, just the amount, even though these men weren't perfect and these women weren't perfect, mm -hmm. the amount of sacrifice of power that these individuals gave up in order to create this country, right? It, the the, the, the self-sacrifice there, I don't know how many people could do that. I mean, look at George Washington. He could mm -hmm. have easily been of the United States King George I, right. you know, like that. And, and yet he didn't. And, and others as well, it, with all their flaws and everything else, the bottom line is they created a check and balance system that denied themselves that power and, and the ability to rule, so to speak. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers, uh, he said that if if men were angels, then we wouldn't have to worry about all of this. He said but men are not angels. And so therefore, we have to put in place uh, these, um, these ways that the, we can balance this power so that there is an accountability uh, not only within the federal government, but, but this accountability that existed and we've so lost between the states and the federal the federal government. And so this is that this is that balance that they were trying to achieve, and they showed that in their own life. I mean, as you just as you began to speak, I thought of Washington, and you remember the people in Europe. Uh, they thought it was one of the most astounding things they'd ever heard of that George Washington would have stepped down from power. But if you read Washington's writings and so forth, as I know you have and you're alluding to it, he did that on purpose. He did it because he was afraid that if he stayed in power, then what they had fought for, what they had prayed for and worked for would all come tumbling down because it would revert back to an aristocracy. And uh, so he was willing to give that up for them. All right, Dell. So another thing you, you say here, I'm going to quote you again, is that Satan consolidates power at the top and makes dependence, destroying their incentive and ability to bring forth fruit and therefore destroying the glory of God. So one of the tactics then, obviously, if there is an order from God where he has delegated this power to all of us, mm -hmm. and maybe even in some cases, kind of a hierarchical structure, right, an order, then the exact opposite, of course, of that would be exactly what you're saying here. It gives us another check to say uh, on, on this being truth, right? Because if Satan is trying to consolidate power, then God is actually trying to delegate this for us and help mm -hmm. us to not lose incentive and, and not right. lose growth within ourselves, right? So Satan yeah. consolidates this and makes dependence, destroying incentive and the ability to bring forth fruit and therefore destroying the glory do God that we would be giving if we were bearing that fruit, right? right? So is all consolidation of power then, would that would that be of Satan? Is that well, throwing, I, out the, throwing off the order of God? Well, the, 
the whole fallen nature of our world today, where that is now part of my sinful nature, my desires, um, part of the desires of the world around us, I believe that there is a Satan. Uh, and I believe, as Jesus said, uh, you know, he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. Jesus was speaking of those who were not his, and they were following then what what Satan wanted to do. Satan always wants to destroy the glory that is due to God. He hates anyone who gives glory to God, and so he wants to destroy that. Well, in this modus operandi of God creating and giving his creatures, delegating to them the right and the power uh, to be able to plant seeds, to be able to make shoes, to, to be fruitful, to have families and children, and all of that brings glory to God, and Satan wants to destroy that. And Actually, next time we're together, we're going to talk about what I believe is a demonic worldview that is attempting to destroy all of social order. But what we're talking about here is Satan's desire, which is the opposite of God. So God delegates authority so that the smallest creature might bring forth fruit, and that brings glory to God. Satan consolidates power at the top, makes dependence, destroying their incentive to be fruitful, and destroying their fruitfulness. And and I would submit to you that History is littered, the dis- dustbin of history is littered with nation states that have done this. And unfortunately, we're doing it now. We're doing the same thing over and that has been done over and over again. The state is becoming so powerful, so consolidated. Uh, it is tipped this nurture and comfort. It thinks it can um, uh, be the feeder of everybody, <clears throat> and that will destroy the. That's one of the reasons why we can't get people to work. Uh, that's how this ends. It ends with a, a nation that becomes fruitless. And that's what Satan wants. That's exactly what he wants. Yeah, it's... Uh, the, 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 what, what's interesting is that the, the fruit of this, I think, between those two, that, that the delegation of God and the tyranny of Satan, is is as you say, it makes dependence and destroys incentive. Yeah, uh, it, w- w- with when Satan consolidates his power, and and it, it's it even goes beyond that really because it, it doesn't just make dependence on say the state and 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 lose you know people that lose incentive, but in many cases as you consolidate power, those dependents lose power within themselves to choose. To have opportunity and liberty of that choice, and 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 to grow and become and and and, and bear that fruit, right? That uh, that that God's looking for. You look at drugs, for example. I mean, drugs remove agency; they make you completely dependent mm-hmm, mm-hmm. On, on something with an addiction, and they make you lose your agency as well. And and right. and now all of a sudden, the power that you know you had delegated to yourself from god you've now given that up right you've given that right. to the other side yeah yeah and that you know that's a good a good picture for us to talk about because <clears throat> anything <clears throat> anything that destroys the incentive for god's creatures to be fruitful which is why he created he created us and put us in these uh, social systems uh, even the inanimate world, he created all those things so that they might be fruitful. The, the sun shines. So what is the fruit of the sun? It shines. What is the fruit of clouds? It rains. Uh, and so we then have been given the privilege, because God's granted us authority to do that, to be fruitful in our lives. Well, the enemy doesn't want us to be fruitful. And so the consolidation of power means I give up power or someone takes it from me. Drugs are the same way. I initially you could say you've given power to the drugs, but what the drugs do is they take it away. They take it from you. So in the end, you are dependent upon that drug. And as we know, most people who are addicted like that, their fruitfulness declines, sometimes almost down to zero. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost as if, you know, it's it's that power has been delegated to you by God. So it comes from God, and then you can do the same 
and delegate that power of God to others in the right position when you're given that opportunity, or you can divert that power and, and give it away to the other side, so to speak, right? You can, you can divert, you can create the same thing that God gave you and, and, and further that delegation of goodness and righteousness and order and, and power to elsewhere, or you, you can give it up to something else, which would include the state. I think as well. that's exactly right, and and those things, both those drugs and the and the the statism and the tyranny of the state, come as a result of people that are seeking their own pleasure and comfort, and are willing then to give up the responsibilities they've been given, the authority they've been given, the opportunities they've been given. They're willing to give that up to someone else. And what happens is that someone else becomes uh, your tyrant. It becomes your slave owner. You become a slave then uh, to them, whether that's to drugs or whether that's to the king. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to finish off with this here. <clears throat> you say, and this is very interesting in our time because it's different than it was in the last century. But you say here, we face a more terrible beast today, one that has multiple horns. It is a confederation of not only the power of the federal state, but it is joined by the power of academia, media, entertainment, and labor. Now, there are pernicious ideologies that have been around for, well, they've been around forever, but they've been uh, uh, fomented and coded, so to speak, in the last couple hundred years, where it used to be that that all of the power was just the state. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we would fight against. That was easy, right? When you go back and you look at the 20th century and you had Nazism and you had you had uh, uh, communism and you know that fight against the with the wall falling and everything else, it was it was this, you know, the power, the power in the state over there, and we have power also as individuals here in the United States and in the West. But now, what these pernicious ideologies have done is they have figured out how to work in the West a lot easier, and they have brought in the corporations, the businesses, along with the state as as kind of uh, this tag teaming to implement this culture, change culture, which then changes policies and procedures and brings power to these companies and to the state. So we've got this now conglomeration of, of, of businesses, all of our institutions practically to some degree, and the state working hand in hand together. Yeah. How do you fight that? <laughs> the, it's tough. Uh, it's really tough because we've never been in this situation before. I mean, it's it's uh, you need to be careful anytime we say that you know our situation today is is different than anything in human history uh, because we have a tendency to always think our generation special and so forth. Well, there is something different about this day and age, and it has to do with the internet. And I'm not trying to paint horns on. I'm just saying that. That single thing has allowed, uh, for example, it allows it allows a twelve-year-old kid to sit in a room somewhere and speak to the whole world. And if he does it in the right way, he can become a very powerful, very famous, and so forth. That never, never in the history of mankind has that ever been capable. And now we have uh, technology giants. We'll say that have never in history have they had the power to be so pervasive and invasive into an individual's life and financial well-being the way we see it today. Now, I, I know friends who've lost their financial well-being. It wasn't because of the black-booted, you know, troops and the, and the black helicopters from the state. It wasn't that. It was these other sources of power that have become so huge in our life that um, the entertainment, the entertainment world, you, you think about how much power it has over us and the media and academia. And we'll talk again about this next week, the worldview behind all of this. But it used to be, it was just the state 
that could assume that kind of power. But now we have this multi-headed beast of academia and media and entertainment and and uh, the sphere of labor and technology and all those kind of things now that wield such huge power over us uh, that it's new for us. We, we've never been in this situation before. And, you know, I have I have to stop sometimes and I speak to I, the people of God as the remnant and say, you know, listen, this is not a time for us, you know, to have our hearts melt and to wring our hands, uh, to become weak need. Uh, you know, this is the time for us because we know the truth and we have been given the responsibility to build those relationships with our neighbors and to help help them understand the truth, to pray for them, that God would open their eyes and their hearts and their mind. Um, but right now, this is a very, very unique and very dangerous situation that we find ourselves in, in Western culture. Yeah, I I, I agree with that 100%. I think it is it is new and it's it's like a virus that has been around, you know, let's just talk about the last couple hundred years, but it's, it's like a virus that has continued to mutate and, and, and get stronger and stronger and overcome the antibodies of culture, especially in the West, where, where now it has learned how to thrive within the corpus of the West and the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very concerning. I like that you put down academia first in my mind. And in my study, what I've seen is that, you know, it used to be even just even though academia had always been there and, and been a push. But, you know, 30 to 50 years ago, it was primarily entertainment that was really so influential and in mm -hmm. what we saw and heard, and et cetera. But to me, academia has taken place, number one, in all of this. I call it the religion of academia and all that's coming out of there. Sure is like a different religion. We'll go over that probably next week with these worldviews. Right. But uh, but academia has really solidified itself, I think, is the fountain of a lot of these ideas and, and, and uh, et cetera. It's kind of like, you know, you go back and the, the, the idea of Jerusalem versus Athens or Alexandria, right? It's, it's, it's just, it comes around all the time. It comes right back to this over and over again. <laughs> yeah. You hate to see it because I love so many things out of academia, but that, that, uh, uh, that battle between those, you know, religion and and academia, it it just it it always rears its ugly head. <laughs> well, it's huge, and I, you know, we talk about the you know the, the power that that people can garner, and what has happened in academia is that uh, professors and the whole institution of academia has taken on a position that that is way beyond what it's supposed it, it is supposed to serve so it serves people to help them be fruitful agents that's what academia does right and so if you want to be a good engineer you go to academia and you learn how to be a, a great engineer so that you can be a fruitful engineer and and so forth but academia has has shifted places now and it it has become a place of of uh teaching uh teaching people its priesthood and and what its religion is and uh it foments that and so academia is huge um but entertainment is still massive you know the this the studies show that uh teens spend nine hours a day on screen time and that's primarily entertainment mm -hmm. and so they are seeing in high def uh images and and worldviews played out for them in such a way that they can't tell the difference between what is true and what is fake. And uh, so a very powerful, powerful influence. And then, and when you place it on top of that, that all of these institutions have bought the prime ethic that we spoke of last week, of malevolent compassion. That's the prime ethic. Now for every one of these uh, sources of power, and, and you'll even see uh, uh, giant corporations they're doing everything they can to show the world that we're compassionate, but it's a malevolent compassion, but it's mm -hmm. the number one ethic. And so uh, I, I think I've talked about this and borrow some in, imagery from Revelation, but that is like the harlot is riding the beast that we see in the book of Revelation. Uh, the harlot representing that perversion of the, of the feminine role, 
the, tr the true virtuous female, the perversion of that, and that's what we see today, the perversion of her uh, drive for grace and compassion has been perverted into this malevolent compassion that calls us now to embrace that which is evil, to embrace that which is wrong. Um, and, and so all of these sources of power now all merge together in this single ethic uh, under a single worldview that we will address next time. Yes, yes. Lastly here, Dell, you, you say this is not a time to cower nor have a melting heart. As I said before, what do we do with this? I mean, what what is it that we're supposed to do? It, it seems overwhelming to some people that that you know that this these ideologies uh, and 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 what appears to be a move toward tyranny in many ways right. is is all around us. It's everywhere. It, mm -hmm. You go to work, and these ideas are and and practices are put in at your work. There, you go to some people at church. They'll go to church, and it's there. They go to uh, they watch a movie. They see a Netflix series. It, it's it's everywhere at this point. It's mm -hmm. at their kids' schools in K to twelve. Yeah. What do you do? Well, it certainly is not easy. And I, if I had a silver bullet, I would have fired a you know, a long time ago, uh, but I don't, And uh, except I do have this one thing, and that's, you know, I don't mean for it to sound simplistic, but I do believe uh, that God has left a remnant here in this, in this land, and we're talking about America. There's not a remnant left. You will find a huge remnant left in France or England or, or the Netherlands and so forth, but in this, in this country, in America, there is a huge remnant that is still here. And I think we still have an opportunity because God has left us here to be able to um, influence those people who live around us. Because I think our ability to change people right now is not going to come through just changing public policy. I, I think we're foolish if we think all we have to do is get the right person in the seat of the presidency and everything will be fine. It will not. It will not. And so we have to consider the reality that it's going to have to be the change in heart of individuals uh, that is that is going to change the culture eventually. And so um, I, I'm convinced that we need to to love our neighbor as Jesus has commanded us to do, to begin to build those relationships with people, to pray for them, that God will open their eyes and their hearts, uh, and we begin to work that way. Now, that does not mean that we give up on working for righteousness in the state. It does not mean we give up for working for righteousness within the sphere of labor, or we give up on, on pursuing righteousness in the church and in the family. All of these institutions, we need to pursue that, but those are not going to bring about the true change that needs to happen in the heart and mind of individuals. It really is a cultural battle, right? It it, it's a battle over the hearts and minds of men and women. Yep. And uh, that's that's uh, that's the toughest battle, but it's the right battle, I yep. think. It is. Yeah. Dell, appreciate your time again. Next next episode, we will be covering threat number five, which is the rise of a demonic worldview and the national rift. Thanks again, Dell.